Hey everybody, if you checked out our second episode on Stories of the Road, you know that I left you with a humdinger of a cliffhanger. Stay tuned, we'll get to that in just a few. Hey everybody, it's Mike from 1614 Fitness. I am here to solve your cliffhanger. When we left, I said that I had this great place or this great opportunity to take the residents from the treatment center where they could have a good time, where they could engage in an atmosphere that's consistent with our behavior modification. I told you I was gonna take them on an adventure, but I didn't tell you what it was. So what was it? Believe it or not, it was pro wrestling. Pro wrestling of all things. Now understand it was a family oriented version of pro wrestling. There was no blood and guts. There were no women running around barely dressed. And the good guy typically won at the end of most shows. So that being said, it was a great tool for us at the home. I know that may sound crazy, taking children from a home to a pro wrestling event. But here's how it went down. We'd get eight tickets. I would use two for myself and another staff person. That would leave six for our residents. We would use the six residents who were the best behaved over a course of a two week period. See, we had points. I wanna say they could earn up to 160 points a day. Whoever earned the highest percentage of those points two weeks prior to a show would get to go. And we did our best in terms of making it a nice night out. Maybe grab a pizza or some burgers, something incredibly affordable, and then we go to the wrestling show. What made the wrestling show extra fun was that we would get first come, first serve. See, there wasn't any numbers on the tickets. So if we got there crazy early, we were guaranteed to get front row seats, which we did every time. And let me tell you something, the kids loved it. It was truly a wonderful night out, not only for them, but for us. It was great seeing them have a good time. Okay, so here's where it gets a little crazy. So we were there every month. They would run 10 shows or so every year. So that was about a show a month. So we were there. Now, again, I can't imagine that this is a compliment but I guess I look like somebody who could one day be a pro wrestler. It doesn't sound good, but that's how it all worked out because Jim, the promoter, walked up to me and says, hey, do you ever consider being a wrestler? Hmm, no, <laughs> not so much, really. No, no, I don't want to be a pro wrestler. Again, remember, I got relocated from the University of Delaware. I walked away from a job that my dad really helped me get. It was all about me pulling myself up by my bootstraps and staying focused at my goal. And my goal was to graduate. The only way I could graduate was to go to school, obviously, but I had to work full time to pay for that school. And besides, quite frankly, rolling around in a ring with oiled up men wearing funky clothes and spandex never really kind of interested me. Never dawned on me as that being a, something I'd want to do. Now, don't get me wrong. As a kid, I guess like most boys, I found pro wrestling to be pretty interesting downright entertaining at times. Here's something crazy. My grandmother, far and away the matriarch, not only of our family, but of a little town in Pennsylvania. See, back then, especially in my family, especially in that town, going to college and going to get any sort of education after high school wasn't the norm. Well, my grandmother wasn't the norm. She went to Penn State, she graduated from nursing school, and not only did she work at the Phillipsburg Hospital, but she really became the matriarch and mom figure to a lot of young ladies back then. See, when ladies would graduate from nursing school, they would hope to get a job at Phillipsburg Hospital. Well, most of those ladies didn't have a place to, to go. They didn't have enough money for a home or they didn't have enough money for rent. So my grandma would allow those gals to come stay with her as long as they helped with chores and went to church every Sunday. She would allow them free place to eat and sleep. My grandma was a saint. Well, oddly enough, that God-fearing woman who taught not only at Penn State University, but taught at Sunday school, taught me how to watch pro wrestling. That's a crazy story, but it's true. I remember sitting on her lap, watching the good guys and the bad guys. I remember watching two bleach blonde guys who she called salt and sugar. They could have been the Valiant Brothers, it could have been the Grand Brothers. I was too young to know, but I knew that she loved it, and I knew that there was something neat about it. But that's how I learned pro wrestling on her lap, the matriarch of Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, my grandma. Well, as it would go, 
I would get the opportunity almost on a monthly basis to be a pro wrestler. Jim would ask me, so, still interested in being a pro wrestler? And I'm like, no, Jim, never was interested in being a pro wrestler, but thanks for asking. Then one day, he comes to bat with a zinger. He says, hey, Mike, listen, before you say no to my offer at being a pro wrestler, let me tell you, we're doing a charity program for a little girl who's sick. She needs an organ transplant. We'd love you to help out. What do you think? Well, who in the right mind is going to possibly say, you know what? No, dude, I'm good. I'm good. I don't really want to help her. She's sick, right? She'll be fine. I mean, my gosh, he sees I work with children. Hopefully he sees that I care for children. So when he come to me with this opportunity or offer, he knew I was done. So I took him up on it. I said, listen, I'll do one show. I'll work one show. We'll help this little girl. And I'll go back to being staff person. I'll go back to being student. No more pro wrestling. Long story short, we go to the wrestling event. We get nine tickets this time. Myself, two other staff people, as well as our six residents. About halfway through the show, I excuse myself and I sneak out. I leave them with still two staff, six residents. I go back and do the due diligence, whatever preparation pro wrestlers have to do in that magic dressing room back there, and then it comes time to come out. Well, let me tell you, in my 25 years of plus in the business, I have taken some really silly shots to the head. Quite frankly, I'm embarrassed on some of the shots I've taken to the head. I got hit in the face once with a steel chair and the force was so strong it bent the chair, the chair around my head. I completely blacked out. It was a horrible idea and a horrible thing to do, but I did it. But that being said, I have taken some tremendous shots to my body. I didn't know that one of the most amazing shots to my body would take place before my very first match. All right, let me take you through. So our music is coming on. We're coming out the good guy, uh, the good guy dressing room. And Larry, one of our residents, was in the front row. He is easily one of the most excitable people I have ever met. I know, you're looking at me going, dude, you're wrapped tighter than a fiddle string. I know, I am, but Larry got me beat. This cat would get so excited, his eyes would get big and he'd shake, he'd be so excited. And as soon as I came out of the curtain, I met eyes with Larry. And he just looked at me, his eyes got that big, his jaw dropped open, his mouth got wide, and he just started to shake. I've never been a pro wrestler before, not really sure what I'm supposed to do, so I just kind of ran around and gave people a high five. I thought I was past Larry when I felt the impact. Larry wanted to pat me on the back. What Larry did was leave a welt this big, red, imprinted on my back that I wrestled with the entire night. I can tell you right now, that was far and away the hardest shot I took that entire evening. So Larry, wherever you are, you've got to be top 10 on hardest shots I've took in the business. So that was, good job, Larry. Anyway, six, eight, 10 minutes, whatever it lasted, I don't remember a thing. I know we won because good guys tend to win. I also know that bad guys snuck in the ring and gave us a stare down at the end. But as the story goes, the good guys won, everybody drove home happily. So I'm in the dressing room. In the wrestling business, we call us the boys. The boys are the guys who wrestle. Who wrestle, I apologize. So I'm standing in the middle of the locker room, talking to the gym surrounded by the boys. I said, Jim, thanks, buddy. I appreciate the opportunity to wrestle. I hope I did okay. Thanks again. We'll see you next month. And thanks again for the tickets. He goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Call me next week so we can talk about the next show. Call me next week about the next show? What do you mean next show? You're giving me tickets, right? Yeah, yeah, but about your role in the show. Jim, I thought this was a one-time deal. Welcome to Pro Wrestling 101. Well, it was going to be a one-time deal, Mike, but did you see how the bad guys came and ran in there and stared you down nose to nose? Come on, man, it's pro wrestling. You can't end that way. You've just got to see them next month and you're going to have to wrestle those guys. And I don't typically succumb to peer pressure, but all these guys in a locker room, but keep in mind, I could have been a clown or there could have been a clown staring at me, a, a destructor over here, a doctor destruction here, the mask terrorizer here, who knows, but they're all staring at me like I'm the bad guy. So I guess I succumbed. I said, fine, I'll do it, but one more and that's it. I don't know, has it been 25, 30 years later and here I am telling you about my 25 year career or whatever it's been? What a long, strange trip it's been. Thank you, Grateful Dead, by the way. 
So all of a sudden, I'm a pro wrestler. In addition to being a full-time student, in addition to being a full-time counselor as a re at a residential treatment center. I, I don't know really how it happened. I do know that I met the promoter and we talked about my character. So, Mike, who do you, sell, who do you see yourself being? Well, talk to me, well, let's, we gotta create this character. Again, I'm doing this with a lot of reluctance because I really didn't want to be a pro wrestler. There are guys who live in vans who live on eating noodles and bread just to be a pro wrestler. People spend thousands of dollars to go to school to be a pro wrestler. I just wanted to be a counselor so I could pay my way to school. But something was changing. It's like something out of my control was happening and I was along for the ride. My buddies will insist that I would did everything in my power to be a pro wrestler, but truth be told, I didn't. But once I became a pro wrestler, as odd as it may seem, I wanted to be the best. If you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. So I did. And it was weird because as my career began to take off in wrestling, so became our wrestling organization. We went from wrestling in very, very, very small venues to selling out St. Matthew's Parish years in a row. Years in a row. I remember going to shows at St. Matt's Parish. We would arrive before the door would open. There would be a mob scene of people gathered at the door. You park your vehicle and they would see you coming up and you try to be as discreet as possible and they would literally chant your name as you kind of push your way through the crowd to get into the dressing room. It was as if we were rock stars on some small Delaware level. But it began to grow. But going back to my character, Jim and I talked. He says, well, if you liked a wrestler, who, who would you like? Who do you like? What wrestler today do you think is really good? Well, a long time ago, there was a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Superfly Snuka, who I ended up wrestling with many times and shared many a locker room and shared many a story with. I'm like, Jim, Superfly Snuka, that guy's fantastic. He was so cool, he didn't even have to talk. He just stared at the camera and the place went nuts. And he did this dive off the top rope that was legendary. In fact, he outdid his dive once when he dove off the top of a steel cage in Madison Square Garden that may have been the coolest thing I've ever seen. So I said, you know, Jim, I think Jimmy Superfly Snooker is awesome. Let's emulate that. So lo and behold, Jim says, you know, Mike, we're gonna call you Cheetah Master. Cheetah Master. That's a cat that runs real fast and he's a master. I have no idea where that name come from. I don't understand the logic behind of it other than it's the jungle character. So I became that Cheetah Master Cheetah Master. I didn't even wear boots because I didn't want to spend the money because I knew in my heart of hearts I wasn't going to wrestle very long. So I was the only one in our wrestling organization that didn't wear boots. I wore these little tiny Tarzan looking cheetah leopard things. I taped up every part of my body. I let my hair grow and off we went to the races. That was my character. In fact, if you took Jimmy Snooker in this hand, David Lee Roth, who at the time I thought was the coolest front man in business, in the, in the music business, mashed them together, morphed them into a pro wrestler, that's what I became. And it worked for a long time. So suddenly, I'm beginning to develop as a character and a wrestler. Our wrestling organization is beginning to blossom. We go from wrestling in very small venues to bigger venues. All of a sudden, we find ourselves in wrestling magazines. All of a sudden, we're going up to various spots to wrestle throughout the East Coast, in Connecticut, New York, Maryland, Pennsylvania. We're doing TV in Reading. We're doing TV at the, in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. All of a sudden, we're being interviewed. We're doing uh, photo layouts. We're doing crazy stuff. I'm like, this is insane. I didn't have any future aspirations with it, but man, was it a good time. And then all of a sudden, we get a phone call. Hey, would Cheetah, it's funny because my name's Mike, but in the, for 20 plus years, nobody ever called me Mike. They just called me Cheetah. We got a phone call from a movie company, Ron Howard Productions. Ron Howard Productions? Ron Howard Productions is doing a movie. And this isn't a B movie. This isn't a C. This is an A movie. Ron Howard Productions is doing a movie. I think it's called Behind the Curtain a documentary on pro wrestling. They want to send a crew and follow Cheetah Master as he tr 
rambles up the coast of Pennsylvania, not the coast, but the turnpike of Pennsylvania, wrestles in small farmhouses, wrestles in uh, fire homes, I should say, and all over the place. Hamburg, Reading, small towns, I don't even remember the name of them, but they followed us all over the place. They would tape me getting ready. They would tape me in the ring. They'd tape me at the end. They'd tape us when we were doing the autographs. And I was so excited. I couldn't believe I was going to be in an A movie. They don't use tape anymore. But have you ever heard the phrase, editor's floor? If an entertainer ends up on the editor's floor, that means they are physically cut out of the tape and they fall on the floor? Yeah, yours truly. I couldn't wait to see this movie. I was so excited. And I'm watching, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be on a big movie. I'm going to be on a big movie. And I watched the whole movie, and I wasn't on any of the movie. I don't know what happened. It was such a cool thing, it didn't happen. That was the only blip in my wrestling career. But it would continue to have, be a lot of fun. We did TV. I got the opportunity to make a movie with Screech, Dustin Diamond. Talk about fun. That was crazy. But in terms of wrestling, we really started to gain momentum. We were on all the magazines. We were always rated in the top 500. And Sheeta Master became somewhat of a local celebrity. I was shopping one time with my mother. A little kid runs up to me and asks me for an autograph. I've had the opportunity to sign thousands of autographs, but never in front of my mother. My poor mom just wanted to crawl in a hole. She was embarrassed. Patted the little guy on the head, signed his autograph, and all the way he went. I just looked at my mom, and she just shook her head. So we continued to wrestle. And all of a sudden, WWE guys are coming to our shows. All of a sudden, our guys are going to WWE performances. All of a sudden, we become the thing in pro wrestling. From an independent perspective, we were big stuff. We sold out St. Matt's Parish, I swear, two, two and a half, three years. It was an amazing run. But with that came an awful lot of pressure. Throughout that run, I was the champion an awful lot. And as a champion, your role is very, very specific. You have to put butts in the seats, you have to entertain them while they're in those seats, and most importantly, you have to give them a reason to come back. You need them to come back and sell out the, that arena again. And if you're not doing that, you're going to be moved on. So my job was to be that guy. I selected Welcome to the Jungle from uh, Guns N' Roses. Quite frankly, that was the greatest intro song on the planet. If you don't set that room alive with excitement with that song, dude, you're done. So there were times when we would play that song two times before the crowd would settle down. It was all about the entrance. A lot of times I was exhausted before the match ever started, but it's all about one thing, figuring out what the crowd wants and giving it to them. And boy, that would haunt me down the road. But find out what the crowd wants and give it to them. So we were wrestling in, uh, where were we? We were up in Reading doing a county fair. So it was neat. They had a wrestling ring and they had the stands on one side and they had these trucks, these, these Kenworth trucks as the backdrop. And they had the wrestling flag hanging off of it and they had uh, a Pennsylvania flag hanging off of it and we were filming. And when you film TV for pro wrestling, typically you'd wrestle three or four times. Uh, the wrestling event could last four hours. And you would wrestle and they would cut it up and make a month's worth of TV. So that was normal. We did that in Delaware. We did that in Pennsylvania. We did that all over the place. So we were filming up in Pennsylvania that time. And my goal was simple. When the crowd drove home, I wanted them to think about me in my match with whoever I wrestled, whoever I worked with, that we stole the show. That's what our job was. I wanted to be the best thing that night. So whoever I was working with needed to step it up. We needed to be the best that night. So I remember arriving before the taping started, kind of looking at the environment, because when you wrestle outside, it's different. I want to make sure the mat wasn't slippery. I wanted to make sure that everything made sense. And I remember seeing these trucks, and I remember going, there's an opportunity. So I get in the ring, and I look, and I ask myself, I wonder if I ran across that truck and jumped off the edge of it. I wonder if I could make it too. And after I realized, or at least convinced myself, that I could jump from the top of that trailer from the truck, I could indeed get to the ring. I went to the promoter. I go, hey, listen, I'm sure I can jump from that top of the truck and land in the ring. Are you opposed to that? And more importantly, can we get that on film? He walks out there, looks at it, and goes, are you sure you can do that? I said I was. 
you never know. He says, sure, do it. So I talked to the guy I was working with wrestling that night, and he's all about it because this is, could be a showstopper. So long story short, I end up running and jumping off this tractor trailer, landing on him for the big finish. We pinned him one, two, three, it's over, everybody's happy. What a showstopper. So yeah, my career is full of really foolish acts. And luckily for me, they turned out to be pretty good for the most part. So we are wrestling and our excitement and our momentum is getting huge in St. Matt's Parish. We're getting involvement in the WWE. They know us and people are, are just asking me, hey Mike, when's it gonna happen? When are you gonna get that phone call? In fact, one time I was wrestling up somewhere north, I can't remember, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, I'm not sure, but we wrestled an event and Mick Foley was on. At the end of the night, we went back to a party and Mick pulls me aside and of course he says, hey Cheetah, come here for a minute. Here's my info, here's my contact information. Give me a call if you need anything. I'm gonna pass your stuff all along to the office guys at the WWE. I really think they should look at your work. I, I, I was stunned with excitement, I was proud, I was humbled, I was thankful. I, I couldn't thank him enough. A Couple months later I saw him again and he assured me he'd been talking, in fact he had actually talked to Owen Hart, God bless your soul Owen Hart. Owen took a liking to my work as well. I never had a chance to meet Owen. I never talked to Owen. So I don't, I don't know that he did. I don't know that he had a chance to view my stuff, but that's what Mick said. And I, again, couldn't be happier or more proud that these two legends liked my work and were putting a good word in for me. So all of a sudden I'm thinking, yeah, maybe this it could be a possibility. Maybe I could take the leap from a local wrestling star to something national. Maybe I could get my face on a lunchbox. That, this could be amazing. And ironically enough, it was right around that time that I'd wrapped up my last radio internship. And I realized that that wasn't what I wanted to do. And that didn't have anything at the time to do with pro wrestling, but I realized I didn't want to sit in a, a small studio and do verbatim what our clock schedule said to do. I realized it wasn't as much fun and I realized I really didn't want to work my way up through the ranks in radio to one day becoming a, a bigger, uh, working in a bigger opera or a bigger market, I should say. So I realized it was time to move on. It was right around that time that I decided I needed to look into corporate America, but we're going to talk about it in the next episode. But that being said, I knew at that point I had a shot to do something special. Maybe what I wanted to do instead was to wrestle for 10 years instead of radio. Then I have the opportunity to open my gym. You know, all of a sudden, maybe me going into wrestling was what I was supposed to do because quite frankly, I felt more comfortable in that ring in front of the crowd, holding a microphone, acting like a total buffoon than anything I've ever done before. The good Lord gave me a gift that quite frankly, not too many people want, but I felt I had it and I enjoyed it and suddenly I was good at something and I could see myself moving on to bigger and better things. So I really felt it was coming. So at that time, our story in Delaware was that the evil Glenn Osborne and his diabolical manager, simply known as the master, had threatened to take over our wrestling organization. So the promoter who, became, who, be, who got involved in this story says, wait a second, here's how we're gonna solve this diabolical plan. We are gonna wrestle in a steel cage in a main event in the biggest event ever held. And I'm gonna pick my surprise wrestling partner. Well. The surprise wrestling partner happened to be myself, the Cheetah Master. We promoted and built this thing up 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 and lo and behold, this became the biggest event in pro wrestling in Delaware, at the time anyway. So there it goes. The crowd is absolutely, positively, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the biggest crowd in Delaware, the loudest, the hottest, the most excited and the, good, the bad guys are introduced boos and yells and this and that and it was mean and nasty and they got on the microphone and worked the crowd up into a lather and all of a sudden for dramatic purposes the lights go down you get those flicker here and there you know you know something fun's about to happen and all of a sudden the greatest intro rock and roll song ever welcome to the jungle comes on and when i tell you the crowd goes bananas they went bananas i mean listen they weren't going bananas for the Cheetah Master. They were going bananas for the whole package. The good guy, the bad guy, the pomp, the circumstances, the waiting out, the drama. It's all part of the package. I was just lucky enough to play that role and man, did I enjoy it. 
we run out, the place goes cr absolutely crazy. And I'm playing with the crowd and they're going nuts and we're working them and working them and working them and then it's time to get to work. The fight begins. And as, can you imagine this? The good guys really started kind of beating up the bad guys. We showed our technical prowess and it really looked like we were going to win this pretty easily when all of a sudden, dastardly, they give us a kick, a gouge in the eye, a shot to the midsection and they take over. And oh, do they take over. They work us over pretty good. They beat on me. They beat on Jim. They just beat us, as we say in wrestling, from pillar to post. Just when you thought it was over. Because let's face it, as a highly trained athlete, you can only take so much. Miraculously, just as they're about to pin us, we make a miraculous comeback. Who had ever seen that in pro wrestling before? But that's what happened. The crowd, all of a sudden, excitement, thinking that it might be over. I slam the bad guy. I go to the top rope, just like my legendary hero, Jimmy Snooker. I go to the top rope, and I get ready and jump, but I stop. Dramatic purposes. And I point to the top of the cage. See, the only person, as I said, ever to do that was Jimmy Snooker. And nobody's ever done it, surely, in Delaware. So I climb to the top of the cage. And I stand there. And you can feel the buzz and the excitement getting higher and higher and higher. And just about the time it can't get any higher, I dive. Boom! I hook the leg, the ref counts one, two, and then an explosion of cheers. He counts three. They go crazier than they did even in the beginning. It is screaming, screaming chaos. The good guys had prevailed. But remember when I started this series, I asked you to pay special attention to the butterfly effect. See, a butterfly effect is when something small, seemingly inconsequential, happens, and yet it still impacts the history of you or others. That's a butterfly effect. I think a butterfly effect got me into pro wrestling. I happened to walk by a brochure, a flyer, in a Rite Aid called. He ends up asking me to do it. Then he snookers me in by saying we're going to do one for the ben a benefit for a sick girl. What a butterfly effect that was. This is another one. The crowd is going crazy. Somewhere, however, in that arena of two, three, four, five hundred, whatever was there, somebody gets the idea to whisper one more time. Then maybe the person next to him hears one more time. Suddenly that whisper, that murmur begins to kind of spread throughout the arena. I'm standing over top of the fallen bad guy and the crowd begins to rise up with one more time. One more time. And now it becomes obvious, because remember, I said earlier, figure out what the crowd wants and give them more of it. Here, the entire crowd is chanting in unison for one more dive. So I gave them one more dive. With great dramatics, I whipped my hair back and pointed to the top and screamed, do you want one more dive? They yelled even louder than before. I climbed to the top of the ropes, then hoist myself up and stand at the top of the cage. They're getting louder and louder and louder. And again, when I think they can't get any louder, I dive off. A wrestling mat is actually pieces of plywood laid down often on pipes. Then you lay down carpet to cover up the seams. Then over top of that carpeting, you drape the, the canvas and you pull it taunt all the way around. That way, you don't have seams, you have a flat surface to work with, but still, you've got plywood laying on pipes. When my knee hit the second dive, the trauma caused my patella tendon to, 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 ultimately it led to my patella tendon pulling away from my knee. As soon as I hit, I felt this really great level of discomfort in my left knee. And ultimately it would lead to that rupturing of that left knee. The surgeon wanted me to wait a week to have surgery. But long before I had surgery and long before I met with that surgeon, I knew that my dream of being a pro wrestler was done. I certainly could be a pro wrestler at a small scale, but my opportunity to be on Saturday morning cartoons, my opportunity to be on a lunchbox, my opportunity to be on a video game 
had long passed. Once that tendon ruptured, my path and my journey was going to be somewhat, somewhat different. I remember sitting on the couch waiting for surgery. Surgery was Friday. Monday, I was sitting on the couch, probably feeling sorry for myself. Because see, I got transferred or relocated from college. I walked away from a job that my father helped me get. I saw this in some weird way as being my defining moment. I could absolve all the errors of my collegiate days in the beginning. I could walk away and proud, proudly say I made the right decision about that job. Because I was going to get my degree and it looked very clearly like I was going to make a mark on the national level in the pro wrestling world. But I realized with that injury that all had changed. So on Monday, I'm sitting on my couch again, probably feeling sorry for myself when I get a phone call. I pick it up and it was somebody from the WWE. They wanted me to come up and they were scheduling a meeting for me to come up and, and, and meet the office folks uh, that week or so they wanted. I told them I couldn't make that meeting because I injured my knee the couple nights prior. Then they said, well, what exactly did you do? Was it an ACL, an MCL? What, what, what happened? I said I had ruptured my patella tendon. Well, in a world of knee injuries, your patella tendon, that's pretty much the home run. ATL and MCL knows they're not good, but a patella tendon, a patella tendon, that's pretty bad. In fact, that's as bad as it gets in many, with the view of many. So I knew that was done. So they simply said, well, listen, there's no need for a meeting at this point. We wish you all the best. Click. Reality's hitting me smack in the face. That Friday, I have surgery. They reattach my patella tendon. They, they tell me that rehab is going to be nasty and ugly, and they send me on my way. The following Monday, second Monday in a row here, the phone rings. I pick it up. A wrestling promoter from Southern California wanted me to go out west and travel the Southern California region, the Baja region of, uh, of uh, Mexico and wrestle that area. Once again, I had to tell them no. What a joy that would have been. But no, couldn't do it. Injured my knee. Once again, they just simply said, hey, good luck to you and hung up. And I'm sure they called the next guy on their list. So I guess my plan had once again changed. I wasn't going to be a pro wrestler. Certainly wasn't going to be a pro wrestler full-time anyway. My world had really taken a new course. And I got to tell you, I was beaten up because I really did think in some crazy way that me being a pro wrestler was going to add to something that would make amends for all my ways and my, my, my collegiate collapse my professional collapse. I had successfully indeed pulled myself up by my bootstraps, worked my way through college, got a degree, and then moved on to pro wrestling to be a national star. Well, not so much. That day I realized that I was gonna have to do something different. I wasn't gonna be a pro wrestler for the rest of my life. I was indeed gonna follow my dream and open that gym sooner than later. As odd as it may seem, I thought that radio would be my job. I thought that wrestling would be my job. But throughout that entire journey, my passion was pro wrestling. That was my passion. And maybe I wasn't supposed to go off and be a pro wrestler. Maybe I was supposed to stay here near home and open 1614. Maybe the good Lord had a different plan. See, maybe he really is smarter than me. Maybe he realized that we need to do something and we need to do something sooner than later. So my dreams of being a pro wrestler was over but my opportunity to experience some of the best moments of my life were yet to come. We've got one more episode of Stories for the Road, and that episode will get you to the very beginning days of 1614. We've got one more stop, however. We're going to call that Corporate America. We will see you real soon in the gym. <laughs>